Welcome to the Rivers Church YouTube channel. We're so glad that you've joined us today, whether you're watching from far or near. If you'd like more information on our church, you can visit our website where you can find out about our different campuses, our worship, and so much more. But for now, let's enjoy some great teaching from Pastor Andre as he teaches us how to understand and live in true freedom. This message has been edited for Life by Design, which is Pastor Andre's television ministry that broadcasts throughout Africa. So we'd love to encourage you, grab a pen and a notebook and get ready to make some notes as we are inspired by today's teaching. I mean, you know, freedom is much more than just doing what you like. In fact, more blood has been shed in the world for freedom than for any other cause. If you think of the French Revolution, blood was shed for freedom. The Russian Revolution. You think of India, even with the peaceful uh, protests through Mahatma Gandhi, blood was sadly shed for freedom to be purchased. In South Africa, Nelson Mandela and the entire uh, years of fighting for freedom, it cost lives and cost blood. Even with the modern America, the civil rights movement under Martin Luther King, blood was shed. And then with the hippie movement, peace, love, and freedom, man. Only put people in bondage to drugs, and people didn't end up knowing whose children they were. That's what kind of freedom that brought. But freedom is very, very important, and we need to understand freedom correctly. I found it strange that on Freedom Day, many felt that they weren't free yet. But what is freedom if you don't feel free yet? What is true freedom? When we live in this wonderful rainbow nation, people still don't feel free. Well, true freedom demands of us some things. It demands of us accountability. It demands of us responsibility. It demands of us integrity. It just demands of us good choices. Because if you have freedom and you don't make good choices, leads to bondage, isn't that true? And so freedom is a very important thing. It needs wisdom and it needs character. And so today, I want to speak to you on, on, on this topic, understanding and living in true freedom. Understanding and living in true freedom. Miles Monroe wrote a book some years back, about 10 years ago. It's called The Burden of Freedom. And he says this, he says, the word freedom has become common, overused, and abused like the word love, but little understood. Much of what we call freedom is but a corruption of our desire to have license to live without laws and accountability. There's truly no greater burden than freedom, no heavier load than liberty. You see, today in our democracy, people feel they can do what they like. But even in the Christian world, people feel Jesus loves me and he saved me. I can do what I like, he's forgiven me. No, you can't. Freedom doesn't mean the freedom to do as you like. Freedom means responsibility. In fact, the Encarta Dictionary defines freedom as this, and notice this. It says it's a state in which someone is able to act and live as he or she chooses without being subject to any undue restraints or restrictions. It doesn't say no restraints or restrictions, undue ones. And it's very important for us to understand that freedom is much more than what people call it. Orlando Patterson wrote a book called Freedom in the Making in Western Culture, and he lists three freedoms that he thinks we have. I think there are four, and I'll give you the fourth one when I've read his three. He talks about personal freedom, which we all understand is so valuable in our country, not controlled, coerced in our choices, in our movement, in our spending, uh, in our dress. There should be personal freedom, even the personal freedom to make sexual choices. You expect that in a modern democracy. However, not in the church. In the church, we have personal freedom, but it is still limited by certain guidelines. Are you with me? But we're talking about secular freedom. We need to understand that. So as Christians, we know what kind of world we're living in. Secondly, he talks about sovereign freedom. That's your right to rule your life, to decide what kind of life and career and future and path you want to choose, the kind of relationships you have, that's your sovereign freedom, and everyone should be free to choose that. He then talks about our civic freedom, which we all understand, particularly in South Africa on Freedom Day. That's the right to vote, 
the right to political choices and associations. And the Western world is really governed by civic freedoms. But there's a fourth freedom which is often left out, and it's the most important of all. It's spiritual freedom. Because you can have all the others and be bound in sin and controlled by habits and desires and not be free. How I many of you know people live in modern democracies and are free, literally, except they're addicts to drugs? I mean, you know that freedom means nothing because they are bound. And all the democratic freedoms mean little to them because they are personally held and bound by sin. We need to be freed from sin, hate, anger, these things that you can live in a democracy and still be filled, filled with hate, bitterness and anger and expectation. We need to be freed from those things. You need to be freed from alcohol, lust. These are things that drive people into bondage. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, and I'll expl explain just a little bit here, and then we'll look at four key things, and I'll spend a bit of time on number one because it's the most important but in Galatians 5.13, Paul says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So we are free as Christians, but we can't do as we like. Isn't that true? We're free as a nation, but we can't do as we like. You can't just get to a red light and say, I'm free and carry on driving which is what we do. And that's not true freedom. That's a distortion of freedom. That actually brings bondage. So I want to look at another four headings today so that you've got some clarity. And this applies probably in our nation and spiritually as we look at freedom. We need to understand it and live in it correctly. Can you say amen? amen. Number one, the first thing about living and understanding and living in freedom is freedom still includes rules and laws. Freedom still includes rules and laws. If Christ has set you free, it doesn't mean you're free to do whatever you like. He still has principles. Oswald Chambers put it like this. He said, liberty means ability not to violate the law of God. License means personal insistence on doing what I like. I mean, you know, we want liberty, but we don't want license. That's not true freedom. That's lawlessness. And it seems somewhere along the, low, the road of freedom, we've fallen into the trap of being free from rather than free of. There's a difference. We want to be free from any kind of law or limitation, but liberty then becomes libertinism. It's, it's kind of, I don't respect any authority. I'm my own authority. That's not God's way. There still have to be rules and laws. See, in the beginning when God gave Adam and Eve their guideline for living. I want you to notice what he said. Genesis chapter two, we've looked at the book of Genesis. It says, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Then he brought rule. He said, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Lots of freedom, but some kind of restriction. Does that make sense? In fact, when the Lord sent uh, Moses to free his people from Israel. And I want you to stay with me because this is extremely important what we're talking about, rules and laws. We understand something significant about Israel coming out of Egypt and being set free. There are some important principles. And you'll notice here in Acts chapter 7, Stephen in recounting Exodus, he says what God said is, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and I've come down to what? set them free. However, that freedom was not the liberty to do whatever they liked. And I want to make a point here. Before God gave Israel economic freedom, he called them into moral guidelines. Economic freedom would have been Canaan, eh? The land of milk and honey, dig cop out of the hills. There'd be more than enough. You'll plant stuff. It'll be awesome. But before they got that, he said, if these people come out of Egypt and get complete freedom to do as they like, they're going to be a problem. So he gave them the Ten Commandments. Now, here's an interesting thing about the Ten Commandments. Did you know in the Hebrew that the word engraved, which the Ten Commandments were, and the word freedom are almost identical in Hebrew. They're the same root. So here's the thing. Freedom does not come when you get the liberty to do what you like. Freedom comes when there's certain things that are set in stone that you follow. And we balk at that. We don't like that. 
But God said, if I take these people who were once in bondage and I release them into freedom in the wilderness, you know, they'll make the golden calf. They'll go crazy. They'll run wild. So he gives them the Ten Commandments. Before he gives them economic freedom, he gives them moral freedom. Are you with me? Very important principle. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's uh, interesting that the Jewish writers, the word herit is the word mentioned there, the word freedom and the word engraved. And this is how they describe this freedom as a, as, a, as a Jewish culture. Someone who is expected to use his or her power responsibly and for the benefit of others. A life of Herod is to be found through the dignity, holiness, and responsibility of a life informed by Torah. See, it's not anarchy. It's not just freedom to do what you like. There's still some guidelines. Does that make sense? And the problem we're having in South Africa is not that we've got democratic freedom. is people think freedom is freedom to do what you like. And it's causing chaos and it's harming people. In fact, the best way to describe this is Psalm 119. The psalmist says this, I will walk about in freedom. Why? For or because I have sought out your precepts. I've got true freedom because I know where my boundaries are. Are you with me? It's like when you drive on the road. Imagine driving on the road and there's no rules on the road. It's just a road. You'd be driving up the left-hand side. Oh, this guy likes to ride on the right. Oh, this person doesn't. Oh, okay, let me go off into the grass. Okay, these people are suddenly turning. Okay, there's no indicator. There'd be no, we have the freedom to drive on highways because there's established boundaries. It's when those are broken that we end up with chaos. You've got to be careful to understand freedom correctly and not think it's like the desire, I can do what I like. No, you can't. None of us can, especially Christians. And some of the teaching that's emerged in the Christian church has actually harmed the church because people say, Jesus has forgiven you. He said, the sun set you free. You can do what you like. No, you can't. There's still guidelines in the scripture and they are great because they give us freedom. James chapter one and verse 25. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Not limited, cramped, or restricted, blessed. Why? Because they continue in what they know. And, uh, you know, people think that people who are completely free from responsibility are free. They're actually not. People who live on the street, hobos, for instance, you can look at them, oh, you don't have a bond, you don't have a car payment, you don't pay insurance, you're free. No, they are bound. Bound to alcohol, bound to small thinking, bound to poverty mentality, bound to victim thinking, bound to blaming society. You who work from nine to five are free to choose what jacket, shoes, holiday, car, furniture, and food you eat. You've got to get the right understanding of freedom, a biblical view of freedom, not a secular view only. Are you with me? South Africa is in great danger right now because we're moving across the world, actually, into a place where we do what we like. And the Bible tells us in the book of Judges it was like that. In fact, in Judges 21, it says there was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. Bad for a culture. That's not freedom. God needs authority, and we need authority in our life. And it's so sad that today, even in the Christian church, I find people say, you know, you mustn't go to a church that puts you in bondage, you know, the Bible, you know, Jesus died. No, when it often talks about the law, can I just say this? When it talks about the law in the scriptures that we free from the law, most of the time it means ceremonial law. It doesn't mean moral law. God doesn't change his mind. I used to be cross with you. Now you can jump on the bed, jump through the windows. No, it, it's like a nutty parent. Strict. Six cuts if you do this. If you don't speak quiet, suddenly in the New Testament, ah, jump on the walls, jump through the windows. Come home three o'clock in the morning, smoke grass to do it. Come on. <laughs> Got to read the Bible correctly. Because confines and laws are very good for us. You see, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says this. He says, for you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Now notice what that means. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. There must be some kind of authority. In fact, Galatians 5.13 is identical to this passage, and Paul writing is, is echoing the words of Peter. And so we are free, but our freedom is not just tied to a constitution. It's tied to God's guidelines, because spiritual freedom is even more important than constitutional freedom. Nelson Mandela said this, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Is this making sense today? 
Number two, the second thing about understanding and living in freedom is freedom involves responsibility. Someone in America said this, we have the Bill of Rights, but what we need is a Bill of Responsibilities. <laughs> we focus on our rights, but what about our responsibilities? Do you know that if you're free as an individual, take it away from politics, if you're free as an individual, you have a responsibility to stay free. What's that responsibility? You've got to eat properly. Otherwise, you will end up in hospital, confined, told what to do by doctors. If you're a free citizen under a constitution, but you keep disrespecting other people and breaking the law, they will give you the ultimate limit of freedom and put you in jail. It's your responsibility. The freedom of the constitution doesn't mean you can just do what you like and you're always free. Make sense? Wait. You can be completely free constitutionally, but if you keep taking drugs or keep drinking, you become an alcoholic, you're constitutionally free, but you're completely bound because you didn't take responsibility. Make sense? I can see you love this. <laughs> Sigmund Freud was a psychologist and he wrote a book called Civilization and its Discontents. And he says this, he says, most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility and most people are frightened of responsibility. Now, when Israel was in slavery, listen to this, when Israel was in slavery in Egypt, they didn't need to do anything for themselves. They had no responsibility. Their food, their shelter, their work, their schedule, everything was done for them. Isn't that true? And when you're in slavery, other people control you. But the minute you become free, you now have to take responsibility for yourself. God takes them through the wilderness, takes them into the land of Canaan. He gives them the blessing. But the minute they enter Canaan, something happens. The manna stops. Why? Because now I'm no longer responsible for you. You are free and not responsible for yourself. So you can't be free and have other people responsible for you. Hear me here. It's a very simple thing. Every time you try to understand complex matters, just bring it back to the family. No family will let their 16 or 18 or 20 year old child decide they're finished with school and university, that they're just gonna live at home with their parents and do what they like. They're gonna play rock music, they're gonna smoke grass, or as we say in Cape Town, they're gonna smoke boom. <laughs> and they're gonna come home late and they're gonna have their friends around, they're gonna put their feet on the furniture and they're gonna use F words. And that. No, you can't have that kind of freedom without responsibility. You must pay board and you must behave here. Otherwise, you can go really be free out there and find out how hard it is. Am I making sense? We see we need to understand this, not just from a family or a spiritual point of view. As a nation, people keep saying on Freedom Day, we're not free. They don't understand it's now your responsibility that you've got to pick up. Am I making sense? You see in his inaugural address, John F. Kennedy in 1961 said these famous words to the Americans. He said, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. People are still expecting something. They say, no, you're free now. Now it's your responsibility. See, Miles Monroe, in his book, The Burden of Freedom, makes this powerful statement. He says, being released from the oppressor does not guarantee a release from oppression. Responsibility does. Then he says this, and I want you to catch this. Irresponsibility is freedom's deadliest enemy. We've got to understand that we need to learn to live in freedom, especially in our new country, and it's the church's role to help people live that out. And number three, freedom must pervade and change our thinking. Freedom is more mental than it is physical. I don't know if you realize it. See, Israel was delivered from physical bondage but they still struggled mentally being bound. Most of the people who live in the modern democracies of the world are free physically, but they're bound mentally. They have certain kinds of thinking that keep their lives small. They blame other people. They expect from government what government can't give them. And so their lives are restricted, not by their physical restraints or because of the constitution, but because of their thinking that has not been renewed. If you're making notes today, it would be good to write this phrase down. Position doesn't always equal disposition. You can be free in your position, but your disposition is us, I'm still bound. And a lot of people would say this in South Africa, even on Freedom Day, I hear it all the time. It's not what we thought it would be. 
Well, that's not unusual, by the way, church, because that's exactly what Israel thought. When Israel came out of Egypt into the wilderness, it's not what we thought it would be. And when you think it's not what you think it should be, your thinking is completely messed up. I want you to notice something about Israel because their perception of reality was completely distorted even though they were completely free. They say this in Numbers 11, speaking to Moses. It says the rabble with them began to crave other food and again the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. Now listen to this. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. You'd think they'd want one of Santon's restaurants. <laughs> but now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Their reality was distorted. They actually saw slavery as a blessing. Why? Because responsibility was expected of them. And their thinking was still thinking like captive people instead of thinking like free people. Are you with me today? This is so important for us to understand, lest we have a bondage mentality, both secularly and spiritually. We've got to understand how this works. Miles Monroe, again in his book, says this. He says, therefore, it is possible to be delivered and yet not be free. Deliverance is not freedom. Deliverance prepares you for freedom. Deliverance provides the opportunity for freedom, not the fulfillment of freedom. Your thinking has to change. You have to take responsibility. You see, if you look at the Western world, not just South Africa, look at the Western world and talk to people, look on social media, most people feel badly done by in the Western world. South Africa, we live in one of the most sophisticated democracies most people feel badly done by. And I know there are a lot of poor people in our country, but just take it to America where most people are pretty well off. They feel they're badly done by, why? They're not actually badly done by, their thinking tells them they're badly done by. Because they're expecting something more from a democratic freedom that it cannot give them, which only Christ can give you. And what we need is freedom in our thinking, healing in our thinking, and it requires knowledge, and we need to be set free. You know, you know what we often need to do? We need to do what Joseph did. In Genesis 41, the Bible says that uh, Joseph had interpreted the dreams of two men. One of them was put to death and the other one was restored. And so the cupbearer is restored, the baker is killed, and the cupbearer says, oh, yes, I remember this dude. He, he can interpret dreams. And Joseph is where? In prison. And the Bible says this. It says, and he shaved and changed his clothes and appeared before Pharaoh. You see, before you can go into Pharaoh and achieve your dreams and end up at that level, something has to change, even if it's your clothing, your posture. And our thinking has to shift if we're truly going to understand and live in the freedom that God has for us. Am I making sense? Number four, spiritual freedom is what truly sets us free. We can be democratically free, but spiritually bound. Do you know, and I want you to pay attention here, do you know that many people, many people living in democracies around the world are spiritually bound. They are democratically free, but spiritually in bondage to sin. They can't stop sinning, they can't stop being angry, murdering, hating, lusting, stealing. Sin has bound them, even though democratically they have the right to vote. How many you know which one's more important? We, we, we thank God for democratic freedom, especially in this country, after the evils we've experienced here. But we've got to not miss out on understanding that spiritual freedom is extremely important. And that's that what Jesus came to die for. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul writing says, Everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard, and all need to be made right with God. We need it by His grace, which is a free gift. Now notice what he says. They need to be made free from sin through Jesus Christ. Sin controls free people in democracies, and Jesus came to break that and to set us free. You'll remember Jesus entered the synagogue at the beginning of his ministry. He was a church goer, by the way. People who say church is not necessary. Jesus went to the synagogue regularly, the Bible says, as was his custom. And he was allowed to read from the pulpit, which means he was a respected member of that congregation and trusted to share scripture because you had a turn to do it. 
And uh, when he got up, he took the big scroll and he unrolled it. And the scripture says here, Luke chapter 4, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, unrolling it. He found the place where it is written, Isaiah 61, he was looking for. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, or on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you know Jesus was proclaiming spiritual freedom? And don't forget, the Jews expected the Messiah to bring political freedom. Jesus shows that political freedom is not quite as important as spiritual freedom. And that's why Judas betrayed him, because he expected a secular political conqueror when Jesus came and said, you know what's most important? That you're free of sin. When you're free of sin, you can live anywhere. And you can cope with any kind of circumstance. And so Jesus came to bring freedom. And the problem is if you think you're free, but you're not free, you stay bound. In fact, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said this, the scientist and author in his book, Elective Affinities, he said, none of us are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. We need true spiritual freedom. And it's so easy to think, well, I'm free, but actually, are you? You see, Jesus said in John 8, 36, as I begin to move to a close, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Watch this. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We can't set ourselves free. You know, in South Africa, we can all vote, and we can determine the course of our country. But when it comes to spiritual things, you need God to do it for you. Jesus says he will die for our sin, and he did die for our sin, and now if we receive him, he sets us free. In fact, Paul writing to the church here, Acts chapter 13, he says, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. We can't save ourselves. Politically, we can decide things, but spiritually, we can't. We have to go to God and say, I don't know how to do this. Would you break that hold over me? Because here's the thing, sin has got power and it has a penalty. It doesn't just have a penalty, you don't just go to hell. Sin has a power and as a result of the power, it has a penalty. So how do we not get the penalty? Is we break the power. How do we break the power? Through Jesus. We receive him as Lord and Savior and then we begin to live by his word.